Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Sacred Lands, Sacred Ecologies, Poetic and Photographic Engagements, featuring Craig Santos Perez and Shubankar Banerjee. I'm Evan Graves, Assistant Director at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music, and we are very pleased that you could join us today. The Institute of Sacred Music is an interdisciplinary graduate center here at Yale dedicated to the study and practice of sacred music, worship, and the related arts. Today's webinar is the first in a series that is titled Mass Extinction, Art, Ritual, Story, and the Sacred. If you would like to register for upcoming webinars in this series, please follow the link that we're gonna put in the chat right now. And that will show you a list of our three upcoming webinars, um, each of which does require a separate registration. Um, today's webinar also coincides with the start of a new program here at the Institute of Sacred Music. And I'm delighted to announce the launch of our Religion, Ecology, and Expressive Culture Initiative. This project seeks to foster dialogue and disseminate work by scholars, artists, leaders, and activists across all disciplines in religious and indigenous traditions who work at the intersection of religion, ecology, and the arts. I encourage you to follow the link, uh, another link we're gonna put in the chat to explore more about this initiative and our call for proposals. Uh, but as a teaser, I will mention that in our first round of applications, we will be accepting proposals for projects uh, ranging from conferences to performances and from art exhibitions to virtual events. Um, and the deadline will be March 30th um, for that first call. And you can find out more about eligibility and application process online. So with that, I would like to introduce the convener of this webinar series here at the ISM and our moderator for today, Dr. Ryan Dar. Uh, Dr. Dar is postdoctoral associate in religion, ecology, and expressive culture here at the ISM. And his research and teaching studies mass extinction through the lens of theology, philosophy, and literature. So I will pass it over to Dr. Dar. Thank you, Evan. And welcome again, everyone. I'm so glad to see so many people in attendance for this webinar, and I'm especially grateful to our two wonderful speakers for agreeing to participate. Just last month, the UN Conference on Biodiversity held its 15th Conference of the Parties meeting with the goal of making progress toward international cooperation on stemming the tide of biodiversity loss. The tone was one of urgency. As the rate of extinction accelerates, many worry that we are entering a mass extinction event the sixth in Earth's long history. In this webinar series, we'll explore the topic of mass extinction through the lens of art, ritual, story, and the sacred to better understand not only what is happening, but also what it means, how we are a part of it, and how we can respond. Over the next month, we'll hear from an exciting group of scholars and artists whose work engages this important topic. Before going any further, let me give you a quick outline of the plan for this webinar. I'm going to begin by introducing both of our speakers. They'll both speak for 15 to 20 minutes each, first Craig, then Shubankar. I'll then give them an opportunity for dialogue if either would like to make a comment on or ask a question of the other, and then we'll turn to Q&A. You're welcome to submit your question in writing using the Q&A function at any point throughout the webinar, and I'll be compiling them. I just ask that you do your best to keep the question concise, uh, and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible. Now for the introductions, there's so much I could say about these two speakers, uh, but I'll keep these introductions quick to save time for their presentations and the discussion. Dr. Craig Santos Perez is an indigenous, indigenous Pacific Islander from Guam. He's the co-editor of six anthologies and the author of five books of poetry and the monograph, Navigating Chamaru Poetry, Indigeneity, Aesthetics and Decolonization. He's a professor in the English department at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. Shubankar Banerjee is a professor of art and ecology and the founding director of the Center for Environmental Arts and Humanities at the University of New Mexico, a co-editor of the Routledge Companion to Contemporary Art, Visual Culture and Climate Change. Banerjee most recently served as the director and co-curator with Jennifer, Jennifer Garcia Peacock of the A Library, A Classroom in the World project for the 2022 Venice Biennial Art Exhibition, Personal Structures, which was organized and hosted by the European Cultural Center and won the 2022 ECC Award for University and Research Project. He's currently completing a book on shorebirds, Birds of the Wind, which is forthcoming from Seven Stories Press. 
So again, thank you for joining us today. Um, and thank you to both of our speakers. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Craig, whose presentation is titled Pacific Islander Extinction Stories and Sacred Ecologies. Well, half a day, total time to greetings to everyone. Thank you so much, Ryan and Evan, for inviting me to be part of uh, this really important series. Uh, thank you to the Religion, Ecology, and Expressive Culture Initiative at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music uh, for hosting us. I'm going to uh, read some poetry from uh, my most recent book of poems called Habitat Threshold, which was released by Omnidon Publishing in 2020. And it's a collection of eco poetry. I'm going to read from the middle section of the book, uh, whose main themes are uh, human animal relations, uh, endangerment and extinction, and multi species justice. This first poem is entitled Silent Spring Haiku. And it begins with a sentence from Rachel Carson quote, Everywhere was a shadow of death, end quote. Silent Spring Haiku. Dead bees seed the bed of our garden. What flowers unpollinated? This next poem is titled Blood Ivory. And it takes place at the Honolulu Zoo here in Hawaii where I live. And uh, wrote it after I took my daughter there on World Elephants Day. Blood Ivory. When we reach the elephant enclosure, I lift our daughter up so she can see them playing in shallow ponds. Look, I say, they love the water just like you. Today, 96 elephants are being massacred across Africa's scarred savanna. Armed poachers surround the herds who stomp, trumpet, and encircle their calves. Bullets, those small human tusks, bite through thick, wrinkled skin. Do the men still feel awe or majesty, or do they only feel their own awful poverty as they sever the incisors once used to split bark and forage? Warlords will sell this white gold to be carved into jewelry, relics, and art, then smuggled across the planet, our man-made elephant graveyard. This year, 35,000 will be slain. Our daughter waves goodbye to them as we walk towards the exit. Do we build zoos to save what we've sacrificed, to display what we dominate, or to cage our own wild urge to kill every breathing being? Our daughter plays with a stuffed elephant doll in the gift shop. Look, I say, it has ears, eyes, and a mouth just like you. She touches its tusks, smiles, then touches her own teeth. So my daughter uh, makes an appearance in many of these poems and uh, many of them are inspired by um, being a new parent uh, when she was born in 2014. And this next poem was uh, came out of me reading Dr. Seuss to her and I decided to what I call recycle a Dr. Seuss book into a poem. And so this next poem is called One Fish, Two Fish, Plastics, Dead Fish. Some fish are sold for sashimi, some are sold to canneries, and some are caught by hungry slaves to feed what wealthy tourists crave. Farm fish, fish sticks, frankenfish collapse. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, from the Indian to the Arctic, from here to there, dead zones are everywhere. Overfishing, purse scene, ghost fishing, bycatch. This one has a little radiation. This one has a little mercury. Oh me, oh my, what schools of bloated fish float by. Here are fish that used to spawn, but now the water is too warm. Some are predators and some are prey. Who will survive? I can't say. Say, look at its tumors. One, two, three. How many tumors do you see? Two fish, one fish, filet fish no fish. This next poem is titled The Sixth Mass Extinction. The 
This next poem is titled, Thanksgiving in the Plantation of Sea. Thank you, instant mashed potatoes. Your bland taste makes me feel like an average American. Thank you, incarcerated Americans, for filling the labor shortage and packing potatoes in Idaho. Thank you, canned cranberry sauce, for your gelatinous curves. Thank you, native tribe in Wisconsin. Your lake is now polluted with phosphate discharge from nearby cranberry bogs. Thank you, crisp green beans. You are my excuse for eating dessert a la mode later. Thank you, indigenous migrant workers, for picking the beans in Mexico's farm belt. May your bodies survive the season. Thank you, NAFTA, for making life dirt cheap. Thank you, Butterball Turkey, for the word Butterball, which I repeat all day. Say it with me, Butterball, 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 because it helps me swallow the bones of genocide. Thank you, Dark Meat, for being so juicy. No offense, dry and fragile white meat, you matter too. Thank you, 90 million factory farm turkeys for giving your lives during the holidays. Thank you factory farm workers for clipping turkey toes and beaks so they don't scratch and peck each other in overcrowded dark sheds. Thank you stunning tank for immobilizing most of the turkeys hanging upside down by crippled legs. Thank you stainless steel knives. Thank you scalding hot defeathering tank for finally killing the last still conscious turkeys. Thank you, turkey tails, for feeding Pacific Islanders all year round. Thank you, empire of slaughter, for your fatty leftovers. Thank you, tryptophan, for the promise of an afternoon nap. And thank you, dear listeners, for joining me at the table of this poem. Please join hands, bow your heads and repeat after me. Let us bless the hands that harvest and butcher our food. Bless the hands that drive delivery trucks and stock grocery sh shelves. Bless the hands that cooked and paid for this meal. Bless the hands that bind our hands and force feed our endless mouth. May we forgive each other and be forgiven. This next poem, also related to food in a way, uh, is called Cockroach Ode. My oldest memory is waking from a nap to a cockroach staring at me. It doesn't move as I clutch its dark body with my toddler fingers. When I bite down, it hisses, legs, wings fluttering. Have you ever seen a decapitated cockroach scurry? Today, rising sea levels threaten their populations because they can't swim. But don't worry, they breed a will to thrive. There are too many of us attitude. They're the first terrestrial beings to birth in space, pre-Jurassic, post-nuclear, future milk. They've learned to avoid the violent light of human eyes. I can still feel its antennae searching my tongue for the foul saliva of extinction. Blessed be the cockroaches, for they shall inherit the warming earth. This next poem is entitled, We Aren't the Only Species who age, who change, who language, who pain, who play, who pray, who save, who mate, who native, who take, who break, who invade, who claim, who taste, who want, who talk, who crawl, who walk, who yawn, who trauma, who laugh, who care, who hear, who fear, who steal, who heal, who friend, who remember who sex, who nest, who settle, who smell, 
who help, who eat, who feed, who greed, who sleep, who seed, who need, who belong, who bleed, who speak, who see, who breathe, who breathe, who breathe, who think, who drink, who sing, who thirst, who birth, who kill, who smile, who lick, who listen, who kiss, who give, who sick, who piss, who swim, who migrate, who die, who fight, who cry, who hide, who sign, who mourn, who mourn, who mourn, who work, who school, who tool, who colonize, who bond, who protect, who hope, who lose, who love, who lonely, who touch, who moan, who drown, who hurt, who hunt, who run, who hunger, who music, who nurse, who suffer, who build, who trust, who bury, who future, who past, who present, who house, who house, who house on this our only. Okay, I just have two more poems to share. Um, this next one is uh, entitled Echo Location. And it's dedicated to a well that scientists uh, call J35 or Talequa. It's a, a orca who gave birth in 2018, uh, but sadly its calf uh, died soon after birth. Um, but for those who saw this on the news, uh, ended up carrying this calf uh, a couple of weeks, about 18 days or something uh, in mourning. And so I wrote this poem uh, in response. Echo location. My wife plays with our daughter while I cook dinner. On the news, we watch you struggle to balance dead calf on your rostrum. Days passed. We drive our daughter to preschool and to the hospital for vaccinations. You carry your child's decomposing body a thousand nautical miles until every wave is an elegy until our planet is an open casket. How do you say sorry in your dialect of sonar calls and whistles? What is mourning but our shared echo location? Today, you let go so her body could fall and feed others. Somehow, you keep swimming. We walk to the beach so our daughter can build sandcastles. May she grow in the wake of your resilience. May we always remember love is our wildest oceanic instinct. And if, uh, if you follow orcas, um, you might know that this same well gave, gave birth again to a calf uh, during the pandemic. And, and that calf seems to do uh, a thriving so far. Okay, thank you again for listening. It's my final poem. It's uh, dedicated to a native Hawaiian bird called the Kauai O'o, whose song was last heard here in 1987. And the poem is titled, The Last Safe Habitat. I don't want our daughter to know that Hawaii is the bird extinction capital of the world. I don't want her to walk around the island feeling haunted by tree roots buried under concrete. I don't want her to fear the invasive predators who slither, pounce, bite, swallow, disease, and multiply. I don't want her to see paintings and photographs of birds she'll never witness in the wild. I don't want her to imagine their bones in dark museum drawers. I don't want her to hear their voice recordings on the internet. I don't want her to memorize and recite the names of 77 lost species and subspecies. I don't want her to draw a timeline with the years each was first collected and last sighted. I don't want her to learn about the Kauai O'o who was observed atop a flowering ohia tree, calling for a mate day after day, season after season, because he didn't know he was the last of his kind. Until 
one day he disappeared forever into a nest of avian silence. I don't want our daughter to calculate how many miles of fencing is needed to protect the endangered birds that remain. I don't want her to realize the most serious causes of extinction can't be fenced out. I want to convince her that extinction is not the end. I want to convince her that extinction is just a migration to the last safe habitat on earth. I want to convince her that our winged relatives have arrived safely to their destination, a wondrous island with a climate we can never change and a rainforest fertile with seeds and song. Thank you. Thank you so much, Craig, that, that was powerful. Um, I've been um, beginning my class these last couple of weeks by reading a poem of yours from that collection. Um, and I, we did uh, the Six Mass Extinction last class yesterday, but I had no idea how to read it. So that, that was really powerful to see what you did with that. But let me remind you all um, that you can enter your questions to the Q&A function at any time. Um, we're now gonna turn to Shrivankar's presentation which is titled, The Garland Changes Everything, Religion, Ecology, and Justice in the Sundarban. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, well, how do I speak after those words? Uh, they were really piercing my heart and soul and mind. Uh, thank you, Craig. It's it's difficult to it's difficult to follow that act. Uh, nevertheless, we try. I'm getting old, so bear with me as I set up a few notes that I'll share with you. Uh, one second. Uh, I'm supposed to let me see. I'll be sharing with you a few images being a photographer, so bear with me as I figure out the screen. Is that coming through okay? Yeah? Yes, yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Eben, for inviting me back. Thank you, Ryan, for convening this critically important and timely series on extinction. It would be a hard one to endure, uh, but we must, as you can see from Craig's poems. Um, and thank you to Yale Institute of Sacred Music for really launching this larger initiative. Very, very necessary, very important. I'm grateful to be a part and what an honor to be sharing the stage with you, Craig. I will get to the Kinrai, the principal subject of my brief remarks today, but let us get there through a short detour. Last week in my biodiversity course, we read a very short text titled, Are Warblers Less Important Than Tigers? Question mark, by zoologist, Professor Madhusudan Katti, which is included in the anthology, Nature, Chronicles of India, Essays on Wildlife, edited by my dear friend, New Delhi-based journalist and conservationist, Anandu Banerjee. Patti's text, concise, informative, innovative, and thought-provoking, set the stage for the first module of the course, charismatic or iconic versus overlooked or underappreciated. By the way, warblers are small songbirds. Since the turn of this century, my own work has largely focused on the overlooked and underappreciated species, places, and peoples. But we also must not overlook visual representations of charismatic species, polar bear and tiger included. 
Some of you are likely rolling your eyes, asking, haven't we seen enough pictures of polar bears and tigers? Question mark. We have. We are flooded with pictures of polar bears and tigers. Coca-Cola uses pictures of cute polar bear mother and cubs to sell soft drink, while Heineken uses pictures of tiger to sell strong beer. Both are cold beverages sold all over the world. On the other hand, popular books, magazines, newspapers, films, TV programs, and advocacy campaigns from conservation organizations regularly publish sad or sentimental images of polar bears, which then gets critiqued by influential public intellectuals. But if you gather all such images and the critiques and put them into one basket, it will look reductive. They're all talking to each other inside a small, dark well. Instead, if you engage with pictures of charismatic megafauna produced far away from the society's mainstream through the lens of what Yale ISM calls expressive culture, say by indigenous and other artists at the margins of society, suddenly the basket looks wide and big, intriguing and eye-opening, bright and complex. So, in defense of polar bears, few years ago, I wrote a very short chapter, Why Polar Bears? Question mark. That was included in a book on the Anthropocene published by Smithsonian. Today, I will speak in defense of tiger. Even though a very small part of my work in the Sundarbon actually focuses on tiger, most of it is on overlooked and underappreciated species, places, and peoples. Mere 14 years ago, in 2009, the tiger conservation community had assessed that the global tiger population had declined from an estimated 100,000 a century ago to about 3,500, more than 95% decline in population. Quote, tigers could become extinct in the wild in two decades, unquote, was the message. The following year, Russia hosted the first international tiger conservation forum in St. Petersburg that brought leaders from all 13 countries that provide home to tiger. They endorsed a global tiger recovery program and made an unprecedented pledge to double the number of tigers in the wild by the year 2022. The initiative, known as TX2, was, quote, deemed the most ambitious global recovery effort ever undertaken for a single species, unquote, as was reported in a BBC wildlife magazine. 13 years later, the news is encouraging. Even though tiger is still listed as endangered, the global population is deemed to be stable and or increasing. In Nepal and India, tiger populations have increased rather significantly, although there are debates on by how much. Now consider this irony. While tourists in the global north are rushing to the Arctic to see vanishing polar bears, tourists in South Asia are rushing to tiger reserves to see increasing tigers. My statement may come across to you as amusing, but it is instead a statement of protest from someone who hails from South Asia. In 2019, the powerful Euro-American Biodiversity Scientific Academy visually portrayed in an influential journal article that South Asia has little to no promise 
of biodiversity conservation, particularly depicting India in bold red color, about which exactly two years ago, almost this day, I gave a combative talk organized and hosted by the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. So I am grateful and pleasantly surprised to have been invited back to continue that conversation. Today, my remarks will be reflective, however, not combative. We turn, now turn our attention to the tiger. Not any tiger, but the Sundarbon tiger, the only tiger on earth that makes its home in a mangrove forest, where it has to swim almost daily across a watery maze of creeks, canals, and rivers, channels, and has to walk in waist high mud. The tiger's life in Sundarbon is no easy walk in the forest, and it has to, at times, even catch crabs and fish to survive. Sundarbon, situated on the deltas of three mighty rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra, and Meghna on coastal Bangladesh and West Bengal, India, is the largest mangrove forest on earth. And it provides home to tiger, yes, but also to an incredible diversity of life, including 428 species of birds and 350 species of fish, both according to the Zoological Survey of India. It has also sustained vibrant cultural and spiritual practices of the local villagers. Dokkin Rai, September 30, 2022. Our boat is floating on the Boro Gajikhali River in the Sundarban Tiger Reserve in West Bengal, India. Earlier, we had seen a large male tiger cross a creek in the island Pir Khalifai. We are waiting with the hope that the tiger may continue to walk close to shore and we may see him again. Just when doubts begin to cloud my mind, maybe the tiger decided to stop and rest. Maybe he took an interior route. The tiger reemerges from behind a kakra tree. The head is visible, directly underneath a red garland. Looking askance at us, the body partially hidden. I click the shutter. After a brief pause, the tiger walks on. Our guide, Bhavatosh, who has become a teacher to me, gives me an enthusiastic hug, as does Buddha, who is passionate about photography and is the designated boat assistant. We review the photos on the LCD screen on the back of the camera. The image appears, and I hear two words, Dokkin Rai. Bhavatos explains that the plastic red garland is a trace of an offering to the forest deity Bone Bibi by the honey collectors from a neighboring village after they came out of the forest with a successful harvest in spring. To the best of my knowledge, this may be one place, uh, maybe the only place on earth where people of totally different faiths, Hindus, Muslims, and tribal communities all worship the same forest deity. Once you enter the forest, all hierarchies of race, class, religion dissolve. The forest is the equalizer, as an environmental uh, uh, anthropologist Anu Jalai wrote in her remarkable book, Forest of Tigers. They not only worship Bone Bibi, but also the Kindai, the demon god who appears as tiger. The story, story of Bone Bibi and Dokkin Rai are well known and written about extensively in Bengali and English. The question that I have been wondering, however, is this. How do I tell the story of Sundarbon entirely with visuals and visual culture and their interpretations, which will honor the charismatic and the overlooked and their entangled relations that span across places and seasons? Think of what I'm about to share with you as just one small flower 
one marigold in a large garland that I hope to thread together in the coming years. Conflict of wishes. In addition to Kakra, we also see at least two more mangrove tree species. On the left is Goran, and behind that is Poshur, which has a few brown fruits. The trees frame an opening with muddy ground and mangrove knee roots where the paths of the tiger and the honey collectors cross in space, but thankfully not in time. The honey collectors and their family members do not invoke the word bug as in Bengali or tiger. They only refer to him as Dokkin Rai or they. Before entering the forest, they pray to Bon Bibi for protection and to Dokkin Rai that he will stay deep inside the forest far away from the harvest activities. It is actually a poem that is sung. So you can think of, uh, instead of sacred music hosting this event, it is actually a song. After a successful harvest, they make an offering on a tree as they exit the forest of which the red garland is a trace. Now consider the ecotourists of which I am one with a camera. We have only one wish to see a tiger and if possible, snap a photo. We want the tiger to come out of the forest. As you can see, there is a conflict of wishes playing out here. The harvesters pray that they do not encounter Dokkin Rai while conducting harvest activities inside the forest, while the ecotourists floating at a, on a boat at a safe distance wishes the tiger would come out of the forest offering viewing and photo opportunities. This conflict of wishes may seem trivial, but it is one of the most important cultural and economic factors affecting the Shundarbon today. The two sides do not consider each other as allies. The villagers who depend on the forest for honey, fish, and crabs speak of the ecological damage that ecotourism is bringing to Shundarbon, including pollution, noise, and disturbance to wildlife. The relatively small ecotourism industry largely owned, managed, and operated also by local villagers, sometimes speak of the harvesters as greedy and wishes that they would just transition to non-forest dependent alternative livelihoods. Both are here to stay though. The red garland is a proof of that coexistence that affirms that two adversarial models of conservation coexist in the Shundarbon, fortress and rights-based, to which we now turn our attention. Fortress and rights-based conservation. What I have shared so far may signal only local and regional significance, but that is not the case. Ryan earlier alluded to this. Last month, the Convention on Biological Diversity wrapped up the UN Biodiversity Conference COP15 in Montreal that was chaired by China and hosted by Canada. At the conclusion of the gathering on December 19, 2022, the CBD adopted the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which includes four goals and 23 targets for achievement by the year 2030. If you were paying attention, the previous two years leading up to the Biodiversity COP15, you would have known that a major battle had raged between two sides. The advocates of the protected area model of biodiversity conservation, also known as fortress conservation, and the advocates of rights-based conservation. The former model was heavily promoted by influential Western scientists, conservation NGOs, wealthy philanthropists, and influential governments, while the latter was being demanded by indigenous and other ecosystem peoples, largely from the Global South, and their allies, which included the UN Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, and the human rights NGO Survival International. In the limited time I have, I cannot go into those two models. Instead, I refer you to an article beyond fortress conservation that I co-authored with my dear friend, historian Finis Dunaway, and which appears in the current January 2023 issue 
of the journal Environmental History. Let us return to the photo Dokkin Rai, which embodies the acrimonious debate between fortress and right space conservation. In your mind's eye, erase the red garland from the photo. The tiger is now a tiger, a beloved charismatic species. We may title this updated photo, Tiger in a Mangrove Forest, which can now be published in popular magazines and newspapers and can be used by the advocates of fortress conservation and also to promote tiger tourism in the Sundarbon. Now, put the red garland back in the photo. The tiger is no longer a tiger. It is instead Dokkin Roy, a spiritual figure that is simultaneously worshipped and feared. The red garland also signals a claim, not right to ownership of property, but right to belonging in a place, right to relations with the more than human spiritual realm, and a right to harvest honey for survival. The photo, Dokkin Roy, that you see, can be used by the advocates of rights-based conservation. As you can see, the garland indeed changes everything. But there is more. A new concept in photography, question mark. I believe that the red garland is urging us to also consider a new concept in photography. On its own, the red garland is not that significant. Few would consider making a photo if the tiger wasn't in the image. It isn't depicting the ritual that took place in spring. It is merely a humble trace of that ritual. The ritual happened in spring, likely April, while the photo was made in September. The garland shouldn't even be there. Its presence is fortuitous and signals another type of trace, that there was no cyclone in the Sundarbon Tiger Reserve in 2022, which was a huge relief for the animals, trees, and the local villagers. After they endured three successive cyclones in three consecutive years, Bulbul in 2019, the super cyclone Amphan in 2020, and Yash in 2021. If a cyclone had hit the Sundarbon Tiger Reserve between April and September 2022, there would likely not be the red garland on the tree. It would have blown away. A rather small item in the photo, which is not that significant on its own, completely changes the identity and meaning of the primary subject. From a charismatic, beloved species, we the tourists call tiger to a revered and feared spiritual figure whom the local villagers call the Kinrai. Without going into the weeds of photo theory, I humbly suggest that the garland is not a punctum, a powerful concept in photography which was introduced by the 20th century French theorist Ronald Barth. What is it then? I don't know, but I believe the red garland has the promise to open up new conversations in photography. Sundarbon honey returns to Albuquerque. I had to return to Albuquerque to resume teaching at the University of New Mexico. The wait time at the Kolkata airport was long. At the international terminal, there is a Bisho Bangla craft store, government supported. I went over there and bought a small jar of Sundarbon honey, rupees 75, which is less than a dollar. The tiger, unconcerned about the tourist gaze, is moving left from left to right. In addition to tiger and tree, we also see a bee and a whole new world opens up. The bees migrate to Sundarbon from Eastern Himalaya. According to the large format book, Fauna of Sundarbon Biosphere Reserve, published by the Zoological Survey of India. They connect Himalayas to the Sundarbon. An estimated more than 40 metric ton of honey is harvested each year from the Indian Sundarbon and is processed and marketed through a cooperative system that is supported by the government. Conservation in the Sundarbon also includes economic justice for the villagers, some of whom 
are among the poorest residents of West Bengal. Earlier I said, I'm figuring to tell a story of Sundarbon entirely with visuals and popular visual culture. This picture of the jar of honey is one such visual that connects Sundarbon to the world at large and brings us back to where we started, the charismatic and the overlooked. The tiger and the bees appear in the same image and honor rights-based conservation and economic justice along with multi-species kinship. Thank you. Thank you, Srivankar. That was wonderful. Okay, so um, we're now uh, gonna move into a short time for question and answer. And um, once again, if you'd like to submit any questions, please use the uh, question and answer function. But uh, while we wait for that, I just wanted to ask if either of our panelists would like to make a comment on anything from the other's presentation or ask a question, any kind of interaction. I would love to ask uh, Craig a quick question. Do you read your poems to your daughter? <laughs> I haven't yet. Um, she is, she How is old is she? <laughs> she is eight years old now. Okay. You know, as you can tell from some of the poems, you know, I kind of bring up the theme of kind of childlike <laughs> awe and wonder at the natural world. And I want her to hold on to that a little bit longer <laughs> before she has to face the realities of, of extinction, endangerment, and, and other poems in the book are, are also about climate change. And so I just want her to, to hold on to that innocence and maybe uh, romanticism that she feels as a child, just, just a few more years uh, yeah. before, before we have to reckon with these more difficult truths about, about the environment. But yeah, can I can I throw a question at you as well? Sure. <laughs> well, I loved your presentation. I was struck by how many of the images uh, connected to food, whether it be the Coca Cola, beer, and the honey. And of course, I had several poems about about food and and food species as well. And so I'm, I'm wondering what you see as that connection, uh, you know, between between food and these charismatic species. Well, you also spoke about in your poems, food multiple times, especially when you are speaking about fish, very powerful poem. And indeed what I think both of us are trying to do is uh, make this distinction of how food, which is a fundamental right to survive has been taken over by industrial uh, capitalism, right? And how they're using, and in my case, let's say, because I'm image person, how they're using and abusing images of non-human relatives. Mm. That same food then comes back in a sense of survival, whether it's harvest or a cooperative situation. In fact, in the Sundarbon, there is a very beautiful model of a cooperative uh, model uh, that exists. So at all scale, there is this non-capitalist frame that also exists simultaneously that we, we must honor, we must uh, highlight uh, of the same place that that same tiger is being used by Heineken's to sell cold beer, but that same tiger should also appears in a little honey jar. It's not about the jar, but how it comes to that jar and what is the process behind it is, is actually quite beautiful. A uh, lot more work has to be done, but yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. But we have a few questions now. Um, so I'll begin with this one. The heart of being human is self-awareness. And many would say a search for reconnection with the divine or with our source. We often do everything possible to avoid the deep grief that is at the heart of compassion. Please speak to the disconnection with this heart or of tenderness. This could be for either if anybody has responses. Greg, take it on. Well, that's that's a deep question. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I think so much of of our our modern world is to distract us from from the grief and pain of of many other species, and of course, many uh, other human beings as well. And at least for me, as a poet, you know, I try to highlight those those deeper emotions. 
that um, you know we may not be able to to really feel as we just try to survive in, in, in this capitalist world. And so uh, that disconnection, you know, I think also disconnect us, disconnects us uh, not only from tenderness and compassion, but of course from, from empathy as well. And I think that's an important emotion, uh, especially when thinking about, you know, our relations to animals, how we care for them and, uh, you know, how we, you know, think about conservation, of course, as well. So I'll briefly add to that again, it's a powerful question is, you know, I, I, today I'm a university professor and I do arts and humanities, but I have zero academic training in either field. So you can call me a total imposter hanging around in academia. But I, I say that my teachers uh, did not come from academia. They are indigenous uh, elders from the Arctic and, and my biologist friends from the Arctic. That's whom I learned from. So in the Arctic, I was working at the turn of the century when we were witnessing uh, really painful things. Today, climate change is a reality everywhere. Painful stuff. So mourning was a very deep part of uh, that experience. But at the same time, this idea of multi-species kinship, even as we mourn, uh, gave me the hope to continue on. And it all came from indigenous elders, Sarah James, Rosemary Athwan Garwak, Norma Cassie, uh, Robert Thompson, and many, many others. So, so it's, that, it's that living with pain and mourning, even as we move forward. As uh, Craig was saying just a moment ago, that he wants his daughter to experience the joy, the excitement, because those non-human relatives are here with us, still here with us. Those songs are still here. A lot is going away, but there is a lot here. So focusing on that kinship is, is really a very important place to be. Thank you. Here's a question for both of you. How does your medium of choice, poetry or photography, affect how you view each ecological issues such as mass extinction or the natural world in general? Well, I mean, <laughs> okay, I could make a quick remark, you know, uh, the, the term ecology as it is understood in the, among the general public and in academia, that it was of course coined by a scientist, Ernest Hegel in 1866, but what is lost to history, largely speaking, but of course it is being recovered that artists had developed, the Barbizon School of Artists had developed uh, at the same time in parallel to the scientific development of that term, uh, very complex ideas of ecology. And there is a book called Art and Ecology in 19th Century France. And my dear friend at the Princeton Art Museum uh, last year uh, did a book called Picture Ecology, a edited volume where we discussed some of these things. So uh, choice of the medium is that visual representations as we looked at help us if we let go of the commercial space of art and think about more broadly visual culture, then anything and everything becomes a subject of ecology, a little jar of honey or an ad uh, that I experience while being in a plane uh, becomes then your subject. So the whole world then opens up. So it's a very beautiful thing because ecology is about connections. And uh, yeah, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, you know, for me, poetry has, has always been uh, a space where I can process and articulate uh, my emotions. And of course, <laughs> learning about ecological issues and climate change can cause a lot of anxiety. And so, you know, poetry has really helped me, uh, you know, just process that anxiety and, and fear and, and grieving in terms of, of extinction. Um, you know, I think also poetry, the arts and the humanities in general, uh, are, are really creative ways for us to uh, develop our own environmental literacy and, you know, to inspire and empower us to, uh, you know, struggle against the fossil fuel industry or to protect our, our sacred lands and waters. And so, you know, in that sense, it not only can educate us, help us uh, heal and, and express ourselves, but then also, you know, uh, give us hope and, and strength to, to keep going. Thank you. I, here's a question coming from one of our future presenters of Persephone Pearl. 
She says, I'd like to ask Craig about the Thanksgiving poem. Craig, please could you say something about what you were doing when you juxtaposed the horrors of industrial food production with the language of prayer, gratitude, and reverence? Yes, thank you. Um, so I, I literally wrote that poem uh, after Thanksgiving and I ate way too much food and was, was stuffed on the couch. Uh, and then I started thinking about well, where did all this food come from? And so started trying to uh, track the, you know, the sourcing of, of my meal and led me down a path that uh, was, was really, <laughs> made me feel really shameful in, in many ways. And uh, to really confront, you know, the full food industry and, and the cruelty uh, to, to animals in that industry. And so I, I wanted to write this poem to, again, just process those emotions. And I wrote it as, as, a, as a prayer uh, because, you know, that's what a lot of people, at least in my family, do before we eat is we say a prayer, bless the table, bless the food. And, and so I was kind of playing with that, with that genre of, of prayer. And, um, and so that's, that's just how the poem came out. It's, uh, when I do it live, I, I can have the audience. I don't know how many of you actually repeated Butterball or the ending of the poem, but um, it's fun to do it live when we could, you know, all kind of pray together at, at what I call the, the table of the poem. Thank you. We have time for probably just one more. This is one for Shuraker. I love how your image of Dokken Rai makes visible the non-human and more than human while insisting that the human is a part of nature. As an image maker, what do you look for in your compositions to arrive at such complex depictions of multi-species relationships? Can you speak also more generally to different strategies you use to make sacred relationships to ecology visible? Wow, that's a powerful question. And I honestly won't be able to give a complete answer but one of the things, as I was mentioning, that the training really started with being with indigenous elders in the Arctic to, to kind of be attentive to multi-species relations, to be attentive to those kinships. So when you ask, like, what am I looking for? In a way, I'm not looking for anything. When I'm out there on the field, uh, my partner, Dr. Jennifer Garcia Peacock, knows when I'm out there on the field, there is no really aim or goals. It's just being there and spending time learning from, like today, Babatosh, as I mentioned, has become my teacher and he's 20 years younger to me uh, in the Shundarbund. So it's being attentive and then such moments do arrive. That was, of course, a very complex moment with the tiger uh, and the garland. But because I had been hearing those stories, uh, from Bhavatosh and others, that when that moment did arrive, it felt like, um, I wouldn't say even ready, but something in me just made that. So it's, it's being in the place, listening to the people and sincere listening rather than going there with an idea, having read a few books, but just being there, listen to the land, listen to the people, listen to the animals, see them, and then something emerges. So it's a kind of a total immersion in the place uh, hopefully leads to a few uh, images that do become complex, like the one you pointed out. Thank you. Well, let me say thank you once again to both of you um, for your moving and insightful presentations. I, I really can't think of a better way um, to start this webinar series and um, a better first event for our initiative. So we're so grateful for both of you for being here and for sharing with us. I just want to mention one more time that our next webinar is going to be next Friday at noon. It's called Narrating Extinction and History and Myth with Sidia Qureshi and Nancy Menning. Um, I'll put a link one more time in the chat for that. I hope um, many of you will join us for that. And once again, thank you both. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank, you. thank you so much. <laughs>